um, we'll come to my little bit then. And uh, so I write a substack that is, um, you know, it's like the 21st most read financial substack or something. And, you know, it's quite a popular substack. But as soon as I do anything about demographics, immigration, any of those subjects, the numbers go up by about 10 times. I get 10 times the numbers of readers. And I find that just that little fact in itself very interesting. It shows that the subject of immigration demographics is something that people are interested in, that they want to talk about, that they want to learn more about. And yet, I think the subject of immigration has been hushed up for decades. And one of the ways that people hush it up is by not talking about it. The other way that uh, it gets hushed up is by as soon as you bring it out, you just go racist. And or it's so all positive. Therefore, we don't need to discuss it. Well, that too. And isn't multicultural glor glorious? We, you know, we have look at the number of restaurants we have or whatever it is. But so it's clearly a subject that I think has reached breaking point. And so I, f I just find that fact in itself that when, when I talk about immigration, the, the numbers on, on, uh, uh, of readers just go up dramatically. So I am not entirely... Uh, I don't think censuses are entirely accurate because a lot of people don't reply, a lot of people put stupid things on, and I think a lot of people, uh, particularly immigrants, don't... They think they're going to get done for taxes or if they put the thing, they'll get caught or whatever. So, So you know, people who are here illegally. So I don't think the numbers are entirely accurate. But I do think if you look at how many the demographics of primary schools, you will get a much more accurate representation of of reality. not only the, the reality, yeah. because everyone sends their kids to school apart from the few enlightened people who home educate. And not only that, you get a great predictor like the demographics of primary schools will be the demographics of the country in, you know, half half a generation or a generation. So I spent a lot of time last year, and this proved to be one of the most read pieces on my substack, simply looking at the demographics of primary schools to see how they've changed. Because and from that you can deduce what the population, the UK population, is going to look like in, say, 2035. Okay. So I'll just give you some stats now. Currently, white British make up 65% of primary school kids in the UK. Now, um, whereas what, what the uh, Department of Education calls minority ethnic makes up about 34%, and there's 1% that's, that's unclassified. And so minority ethnic means Asian, which is 12%, white non-British 8%, black 6%, and mixed 6%. So... Bear in mind that this is the whole of the UK. So you're talking, it includes remote rural areas where white British is likely to be... 99%. Yeah, or let's say 95% or whatever, but it's likely to be very high. Where I, I'm in the London borough of Lewisham, South East London. You know, I uh, my kids went to the uh, schools there, but also I just, you know, when I'm walking the dog, you see all the school kids playing, whatever. And I guess that, white British is below 20% in most classrooms. And I would say in some classrooms, it's zero. I, I can actually attest to that. There was a, a friend of mine who lives in Chelsea. He had a uh, new kid and um, grew up and then he's going to go to school. Okay. So they went to visit local schools, see which one's good. They went into this one classroom. They opened up to see uh, his age group. And there was uh, one white kid in the entire class of four. In Chelsea? Kids. Yeah. Wow. And um, so they're like, huh, that's new. And uh, without prompt, no and, one said But the anything. white kid might not be... He, he, without prompt, the teacher went, that's Lucas, he's Lithuanian. <laughs> just had to mention. <laughs> like No one had to say anything, and they were just like, okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> so currently, this and these are 2021 numbers, Cu currently we're at 65, 34. Uh, in 2006, so only 15 years ago, it was 80, 20. In 2002, so only four years before that, it was 85-15. So there's just been this enormous... It's 70% in 15 years or 125% in 19 years, the increase. And that's an incredible demographic change. And as I say, what, what is primary schools 
will be the country in 20 years, 25 years, whatever it is. Now, if we were to follow that same trajectory, uh, we would be at 60%, uh, well, we'd be at roughly 38, let's call it 40% white British by 2035 if we keep on the same trajectory. Now, there's the chance that it slows off and levels off. There's also the chance that it accelerates. In other words, we would be at white British minority of just 40% in primary schools by the age of 2035. And I think that is quite an incredible statistic. And it's where we're going. And as I say, what is the case in primary schools will be the case Just think a whole lot of people then. It's not even long. I mean, you know, these these and these are only 2021 numbers. They already will have changed. But, you know, all these numbers are lagging. So this is another piece that I wrote called The Great Decline. And I wonder where uh, where all this is going. And I think about it a great deal. And, you know, just so that you know, my I'm I'm very libertarian in my politics, and I wrote the libertarian national anthem to the music of the uh, uh, the hymn of the Bolshevik Party, now known as the Russian national anthem, because it was it's a great anthem and it was out of copyright. And uh, but anyway, that's the real reason. Well, it, no, because I thought it was it was funnier yeah, having yeah, it to yeah. a recognisable piece of music, and it's it's just funny having the libertarian national anthem to the hymn of the Bolshevik Party, and it's also a great piece of music. So, but. One of the lines in the thing that I call for is uh, free movement, free minds, free markets, and free choice. And I'm a great believer in the free movement of people. But you cannot have a benevolent and expansive welfare state and free movement. You either have to have one or the other. And I always argue for small government, local government, because the problem with the country at the moment is we have an unaccountable, an unaccountable centralised government. And if these, if we're anything like as as mendacious as the US government is, and I suspect we're actually worse, uh, then you know, centralised government is not dealing with the immigration issue in a way that local government would if local people were empowered to do what they wanted. Anyway. That that's a rather roundabout argument, and I can I can I saw you wince as as I spoke. So no, I'm just thinking I'm not for free movement of people, even with a low state. Well, the the there is if, in there fact, is I've less got more incentive not to let them in because like I want to preserve our low state utopia over here. Well, yes, okay, whole other fair argument enough. It's a whole other, it's a whole another argument, but I, w I was sort of basically preempting what I'm about to say yeah. by saying I'm sort of for free movement, but but. The point is, if there's no state, there's a lot less incentive for free movement because you don't get the NHS, the education, this yeah. and all the other forms of protection that you get. And, you know, if you're a, if you're in a totally free market, like, you know, supermarkets were probably in favour of free movement because it's more people to sell products to and more greater pool of people to employ from, you, you know, so so you've got that. The, the problem with mass immigration there's, there's, there's the cultural problems, the loss of the British identity, which is one major issue. But the other problem is that the state in its current form cannot in, adapt to the current influx of new people. You know, we the, the roads can't cope, transport can't cope, education systems can't cope, the NHS can't cope, the penal system can't cope, the courts can't cope, the prisons can't cope. These are all state bodies. And they just... And that's why everything's falling apart because it just can't can't cope with a sudden change in dynamics because state bodies inherently are more inefficient and they move more slowly and they adapt less quickly than free markets do. Anyway, this is all this is all sidetracking. I think at great length, where is this all going? And we mentioned 1984 earlier, and some people go, we're going into a 1984 fascist state, and other people go, no, we're going into brave new world, and other people look to the sovereign individual and say, we're going into a world where there's some people trapped in their own physical economies, and there's going to be all these sovereign individual rich digital nomads who just sort of go from country to country, and there are other people that um, uh, um, make the argument that we're going into... Um, you know, we're experiencing the Great Reset and, and what 
what we're seeing is, you know, all planned by the WEF. And there are other people who say we're going into a hyperinflationary scenario. There are all these predictions about where we're going in the future. And I kind of think we're probably seeing a bit of all of those things. One of my friends, uh, uh, you know, Bitcoin billionaire, who's long since disappeared somewhere in um, uh, the south of New Zealand, uh, he argues that we're going into a world where everyone's just going to be sat in a sort of Butlins or a Club Med type holiday camp with VR headsets on while robots do all the work. That's that's what he envisions. And, and he's, he's, he's been more right than about everything than anyone else I know. So maybe he's right. But where I'm arguing that I think this is all going and it was came up as a result I had with a friend in, a, in the pub the other day and he called it the South Africanization of everything and you look at you know where south africa was in the 90s and all the optimism about you know the new uh, republic the equal republic rainbow republic and all that stuff and then you look at where south africa actually is now and you know these ghetto are everywhere you go in south africa private security vehicles because the police can't deal with it pretty much every state body in south africa is corrupt you, you know, you, you everyone you you see all the crime in South Africa, all the violence, and I think we in Western Europe and to a certain extent the US are going in a similar direction. And because of this constant argument about racism and just slurring racism, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, someone, you know, say of Afro Caribbean heritage might have some historical grievance with slavery. If you're coming from Africa, there isn't the same, you know, you, you weren't stolen into slavery, your ancestors weren't your stolen. Your ancestors were probably the slavers. Well, they might have been. But we have created this grievance. So we, we, we're, we've imported a great deal of uh, people, or a lot of people have come over, and now we've created this grievance that the white Englishmen, you know, they, they obviously came in because there was something about Britain that attracted them or their parents, but now, you know, I just watch it, what goes on in, in the comedy circuit with, with the young acts coming through. Everyone's moaning about racism all the time. And we've created, we've sort of brought a lot of people who come over who, you know, maybe were optimistic about coming here. And now they've got a grievance. I mean, it's a we've, good, we've created a grievance. It's a great fiction to excuse corruption. Like, yeah. all of this, I will obsess about how white people are the devil or white men or blah, 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 blah you know, intersectionality being the most famous religion of our society. But when I look at South Africa and I look at the same here, like in South Africa, the narrative was obviously apartheid, blah, 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 therefore we need to do this. I mean, you get, what is it, the, the EF still arguing that they need to steal land from white farmers in South Africa? It's like, why? You, you think any of this has worked? But yeah. no, it's just a great excuse for the corruption there. I think probably, yeah, there are a lot of people who believe it, don't get me wrong. I think probably more than half of them believe this religious... But... When it comes to but why do they're you, doing it. do you buy that that like for example if you just take private security vehicles you look at old pictures that you know every, every now and then on Twitter you'll somebody will post a video of a car driving around London in the 1960s or something and everyone's walking peacefully around rather Someone like they were off their watch in public yeah like, there's, no, there's no moped who's <laughs> but they're, to they're all walking around rather like the people in, in in the Capitol building you know peacefully around and then and then um, and then you kind of go what happened. And that's the that's the question. What happened? But do you, but now you're already starting to see private security vehicles driving around bits of London, the, the more expensive bits of London at night. In other words, and that's basically saying the police aren't doing their job. We yeah. need private security. And in South Africa, they're everywhere. And I, I worked in South Africa during the World Cup, and you just weren't allowed to go anywhere without a guy standing next to you with a gun. And um, I remember on the last day I was there, we had all these um, clothes that we'd been given. Uh, and South Africa, uh, Johannesburg gets pretty cold at night. And we, was, we were in Hillbrow. We'd been put in this hotel in Hillbrow, which is like the worst area of Johannesburg, apparently, because the hotel we were supposed to be staying in hadn't been built. <laughs> but anyway, we, we were in this sort of guarded thing. And, and I just um, went out with the security guard in the car. And I said, look, I've got this bag of clothes. I'm just going to let's find some homeless people in, in Hillbrow. And we'll give them to the homeless people and he said fine and he came with me and I've said look there's a bunch of guys asleep there in the, in the street go and give them these clothes and uh, he was like no 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 I'm staying in the car you go so and, and he had a gun 
And uh, I remember him like, you go, I will watch, <laughs> was his line. So I got out of the car and I started to pull um, some of these clothes out of the bag. And it was like, it, I, it just, so many people just jumped on me all at once. It was terrifying. And um, and when I say jumped on me, just pulling everything, you know, like one of those scenes in James Bond where it's in Delhi yep. or somewhere and they all jump on him. It was like that. No one queued um, up, did they? No, no, no. And and it, they literally just saw, and it was the color of my skin. They just saw a white man in a place where you, you know, the white man doesn't go. So, but so the only way I could deal with the sudden everyone grabbing all my stuff was to take the bag and throw it in the air, so that it all the clothes spiraled everywhere and everyone went for the clothes and that just gave me three seconds or whatever it was to jump back in the car. But it was it was a like an experience and and there was sort of. The clothes that people were wearing, it was it was poverty like I've never seen before. You know, Dickensian levels of, you know, you, you know, Victorian London levels of poverty. And it was an extraordinary experience. But do you buy that? Do you get that narrative? We are going in the South African... Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, there's a, there's a big difference there as well. People claim, oh, it's just the poverty that makes South Africa what it is in that regard. No, that's not true. Um, take Lord Miles, for example. Are you familiar with him? No. He goes around traveling to dangerous places. He's uh, been to Afghanistan and give money to the homeless there. Perfectly easy. You give them there. No one swarms you. Maybe there's someone else who's extremely poor. You know, you feed some stray dogs or something. No one bothers you. There's nothing like that. He went to Kenya, started trying to give money to homeless people. Exactly the same as your situation. Pretty soon you just have to throw a wad of cash and run. Yeah. Because it's just civilizational collapse on every front. Maybe, but it it's, you know... We need to have an open and honest conversation, and we are incapable of doing that at the moment. Without we're getting closer, but we're in. You know, what is the right level of immigration per year? Is it a hundred thousand people? Is it half a million? What is the right level? Whatever we Japan's need to agree. Doing, I'll copy that. <laughs> but I mean, you know, one point one million people came to the country last year. You half say. a million left, but one point one million people came to the country last year. That effectively means one in every sixty-five people you meet only came to the country last year. I mean, it's just, a, it's an extraordinary number. And I, I'm not saying don't come, I'm not saying do come, but we need to at least have a conversation about it. When do we say no? Yeah, I mean... Why is there no hard cap? Have you heard this net zero immigration? Yeah, well, no, completely right, though. Because, I mean, after 500,000, you'd be like, oh, well, you know, thank you very much, but we're not accepting applications anymore. That's perfectly reasonable. There's, there's no one who could say, that's how could you do such a thing? So, no, there's got to be a point at some point where you say, thank you very much. I don't need any more applications. We do it in every other part of life. But with immigration, suddenly it's it's not allowed. Why? And the answer's never really answered. It's just... <sighs> Actually, it is. Because eventually you do get down to it with leftists, and it gets down to revenge when you get to the ideologues or left-wingers. It's just like, well, you had an empire. So? I mean, I didn't. <laughs> like, yeah. we've got some overseas territories. That's about it for all of my lifetime. But no, because of the empire, your country has to be completely destroyed demographically. So That's another really an thing argument. we don't talk about is the anti-British sentiment among immigrant communities. You know, for there are there, it's I, I guess it's, a, it's usually their grandkids or kids. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who hate the white man. The you know, uh, you, you just see the videos all the time of white people being beaten up. And you know, there's a thing we've got to impregnate the white woman. And you know, they they. There is a, a strong narrative that, that the, the British white man is bad. We saw this recently. There was a story of some guy. His uh, grandparents came to England from Jamaica. His parents, as well, lived here. No problems integrating. No problems with the community. He had a huge problem with Britain and British culture and was whining about, uh, specifically the main thing he was whining about, was the black boy clock in his town. He was like, this is disgusting. It needs to go. And he couldn't figure out why he wasn't welcomed among the locals. It's like, it's strange how your parents and grandparents were, but you're not. So that anti-British sentiment especially does seem to come in a couple of generations I, I now. I think it's normal. You, you, The, the first uh, generation of immigrants sort of keep their head down Tear and booth. get on with it. And then the second one feel more patriotic about the place that they came from. Yeah. I think that's a... And I, I read somewhere it takes four generations or three or four generations to, to fully integrate. It's a long time. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'll go fine. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's that bit covered. And just to sum up that original point where you were quizzical about about free movement, you know, 
ideologically dream in a dreamland we'd have no passports and and nothing but my point is is that a small state where uh, where a small accountable local bodies are better able to deal with uh, uh, mass movement of people than a large uh, unaccountable centralized state that's that's my point and can i just say one last thing yeah sure migration the mass movement of people is is only going to accelerate this is a people seem to think it's going to stop it's not it's going to accelerate and the reason for that is technology firstly with mass communication everybody is seeing you know the wealth in america the wealth in western europe and comparing it to what what they have back home and so these countries look more attractive and then secondly with you know before the invention of the car you'd have to if you wanted to go around the world you'd have to go by horse and and sailing boat never mind the plane yeah but now we have the car the plane the train the 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 high speed speed boat you know the, the modern transport just means it's possible to go further quicker and you, the plus there's never been so many people in the world and whether it's people displaced by war or w lack of water or lack of resources or simply seeking economic e opportunity whatever the motivation there are more people than ever and more and more of them are going to be on the move and technology is enabling them to move further and faster and communication is creating the desire i, I couldn't disagree more on the fact that it's inevitable though because i mean like north and south korean immigration across the border is uh, about one a year yeah if they're lucky uh, that's that's always bothered me because like you look back at photos of the border between gibraltar and f uh, fascist spain no immigration it's because you militarize the border it literally will just stop because no one wants to go through a military checkpoint they're not mad like, you so you would trained. argue that we need uh, okay if, so if we you need... want uh, secure borders you can do it it's not impossible and it's you don't really need sophisticated technology well, okay either. if you use the north korea south korea thing south koreans don't want to go to north korea for obvious reasons yep. and north koreans can't leave yep so my point is become not not become North Korea. My point is if you militarize a border, it will end the same way it did. If you look at any other militarized border, like the movement of people across a militarized border doesn't happen okay. because it's militarized. Yeah, I mean, as a libertarian, I don't like militarized borders, but I I, I I'm just I saying take it, your point. The point the point is that you can stop it if you want to. It's an option that's on the table. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the Brokenomics series, this episode on digital IDs. If you'd like to find out what else is being held, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.